Can a guy who will not even swing a bat in the lineup next season save the White Sox offense? Let's discuss how that seems to be the solution next on Locked on White Sox. You are Locked on White Sox, your daily Chicago White Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I'm your host, Todd Welter, a lifelong Sox fan and the site expert of SouthsideShowdown.com, part of the fan side of the network. And also I've covered Major League Baseball for outlets such as the Associated Press. And thanks for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen every day, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Make sure to hit the like button on today's episode. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you've not done so already. And also follow or subscribe to the show at wherever you get your podcasts. Well, the White Sox officially announced the hiring of former Baltimore Orioles co-hitting coach Ryan Fuller as a director of hitting. Let's discuss if this will be enough to fix the offense since there will not be a ton of uh, free agent upgrades. Then let's dive into the Sox television home, CHSN, officially rolling out the direct-to-consumer streaming and the crazy cost. And finally, top five Fridays, so let's discuss the top five home run hitters in franchise history. And you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, so I love the hiring of Ryan Fuller as a, uh, as a director of hitting. Uh, I believe the Sox, you know, needed this. It copies kind of like what they're doing uh, with their pitching with Brian Bannister, although he just has a different title. But it's good to have standards of how you're going to develop players and also standards of, hey, we're going to play baseball the same way we're playing it in the complex league all the way up to the big leagues. You know, that's what winning organizations do. That's what the Cleveland Guardians do. That's what the Tampa Bay Rays do. You know, you want to have these standards so that you're not basically saying, okay, we're going to do one thing here at low A, but then it's going to totally change when you get to the big leagues. Everything should be done and the standards should be set. And then uh, that hurdle should have to be cleared to get to the next level. And that's what it sounds like the Sox are doing when they're hiring Ryan Fuller. But it also sounds like this is the only move they're going to make to upgrade the offense. Now, a Garrett Crochet trade could yield a Weiler Abreu or uh, an Alec Baum, you know, as the Phillies are rumored to be wanting to trade him. Uh, and he could be one of the returns in a potential Garrett Crochet, uh, Garrett Crochet deal. But other than that, you're not going to be getting huge uh, upgrades because the team said they're not going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting in free agency. And after a, a historic 121 loss season, drink, uh, because I do feel like I also mentioned that a lot. Uh, but you can never mention it too much because, again, of how historically awful it was. You would hope the team would just you know, do a little bit more than hire the former co-hitting coach of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, but then again, you got to zoom out, just see how decayed and rotted this franchise has become and how this team only moderately pays for hitting. And you see that this could be the proper solution, at least at this time, where this organization's at. You know, because it's in the very, very, you know, the infant stages of a massive rebuild, potentially a, a historic rebuild because of where they're at. They won 41 games in 2024 to go from even to 61 games that they lost, that they won in 2023 now would be seen as an, as an improvement. You know, basically a whole new infrastructure has to be built within the Sox organization. So that's why bringing in Fuller should be greeted with big news. This is a big deal, even though it may look like what they just hired a, a, a coach. That's not a big deal. It is, you know, the team doesn't develop hitting and that's going to change, especially since again, they don't use free agency to add premium F four players. They just don't, you know, Andrew bet at still has the richest free agent contract ever. And he's just a, what, two F4 player, if you're thinking about it, just like if you just right off the top of your head, you're like, man, you know, he's just a guy, decent player, ha obviously has had his struggles, but when you look at his career overall, solid career, but nothing that should be the richest franchise in con you know team history, but that's what they pay. You know, and they've also been trying to replace Jermaine Dye in right field, and he retired in 2009. And they've been trying to replace Ray Durham at second base, and he's been gone since 2002. You know, so Ryan Fuller is a guy that you want to bring in 
from the big picture to bring in concepts and philosophies and strategies. I mean, it was talked about well reported during, you know, the team's just epic collapse of 2024 about how hitters just really didn't have much of a hitting plan. That stuff has to be implemented and put into place. And Ryan Fuller, you know, he could potentially fix the offense immediately if he can get Luis Robert Jr. And then, you know, another foundational piece, Colson Montgomery consistently going. So, yes, folks, coaching is the solution. Although there was just too many mentions of current hitting coach Marcus Thames for my liking during the introductory press conference that I want to get to in a second. But WGN's uh, Eli um, Ong made a great point when he tweeted this out. This is that at the pen of Eli. Um, Fuller, uh, he tweeted out that, you know, how Fuller had a helping hand in developing Anthony Santander into a 35 home run hitter and also developing Gunnar Henderson into a potential MVP. So could he do the same for um, Luis Robert Jr. and Colson Montgomery? You know, because you do have to put Colson Montgomery in the conversation of foundational pieces, even though he hit under 220 at Triple A Charlotte, because he's still the top hitting prospect. And his September and his Arizona Fall League showed that, yeah, he can still be a very, very good hitter in the Corey Seager mold. But Fuller did play a help, you know, played a hand in helping develop Anthony Santander into that 35 plus home run hitter. Gunnar Henderson is one of the best shortstops in the game. You know, so, you know, he did tweet out that if you keep Robinson, you know, if you do keep Luis Robert Jr., can he get those guys turned around? Uh, you know, because there could, you know, the Sox could still trade Luis Robert Jr. in the offseason, although I think you'd be selling very, very low at this point. You know, I do think teams would value the bounce back, so I don't think it would be as bare bones as some people are thinking, but it's definitely not going to be the price that you would have gotten in 2023. But although at the same time, Luis Robert Jr. just might need a mental skills coach and better personal training. As you could tell, LRJ was hurting when you returned from that hip injury. And then just you could see the losing was just draining him. He looked totally not engaged at all. And some of that's got to be, you know, how, how do you figure out how to get engaged? And another thing could be is how do you get that approach at the plate like Santander? It can't hurt. You know, as I shared, uh, everydayers heard me uh, um, on the show a couple months back. One of the things, you know, when I was saying like, hey, it would be great if the Sox went after Anthony Santander because, you know, I was reading up on he's got a great approach to his pregame. It's very efficient. He does study the film, but he's looking for those mistakes that the pitchers are going to have and when he can potentially get them. And then when he gets to the plate, that's what he's looking for. Also, I saw a clip on um, MASN, the Orioles TV RSN. Uh, nice interview with Fuller. Accurately diagnosing um, an issue Santander was having when he was going through a three for 33 slump, you know, basically said he was using his upper body too much. Go with the legs. So I like how, and also in this clip that I was watching uh, YouTube, it's great. You know, he's going over uh, Adley Rutschman uh, hitting approach. You know, he's talking about how they needed Adley maybe not to crush home runs so much, but just keep the bat on, on a swing plane as he was talking about like from five to about 20 degrees, you know, on that. And hit the ball hard. Get hard contact. You're going to get line drives, and that's going to produce doubles. And I know I've been preaching a power lineup for the White Sox because I guess because especially that plays well to guaranteed right field. But let me clarify: when I say I want four to five hitters in the everyday lineup that can crush home runs, I also want them to crush doubles at the minimum because the game has obviously evolved to just getting on base percentage. You know, and I, I still love OBP. Yeah, you know me. Um, but the reason why like teams like the Milwaukee Brewers drink, uh, they're measuring OPS more than on base percentages. You want your runners at second and third immediately rather than first. Yeah, it's great to get walks. And I agree that on base percentage has been somewhat diminished from the original Moneyball days. But the reason is, is okay, now you're on first. And if we got to go station to station, that could potentially be three hits to get you in, you know, or three more walks. Whereas, okay, if you're if you're hitting the ball hard on a good con, you know, on a good plane and driving it, like Fuller described, you're now starting off at second, hopefully third. Now it's just one more hit. You know, that's the thing that just these common sense, and that's the other thing when you're like, oh, there's all these numbers. No, it's just applying common sense logic. 
baseball got into these days of it. It had to be, you know, we got to be Ted Williams. And it's very hard to be those guys. You know, you got to, you know, average was just too much focused. Whereas, yeah, it's on base percentage. And it's also not that it's driving the ball, getting the second, getting the third. So then, you know, starting off that. So then you can really start something going. And I like how Fuller gets it. And clearly Sox hitters need to get it. And if he can get Luis Robert Jr. going, you suddenly have a guy who hit 38 home runs in 2023. And that's in your lineup and that should pay some dividends. That's what they got to get going. And then I do think you need to preach a development plan to Colson, kind of like what you did with Gunnar Henderson. You know, he did approve upon that September in Arizona Fall League. But if he can reach his ceiling, that's the thing. Everything now has to be put in place to get Colson Montgomery to reach his ceiling. His floor, in my opinion, I'm convinced he's going to make the big leagues. He should. I'd be stunned if he never makes the big leagues. Or if it's just a cup of coffee. But his floor, I fear, is just Paul DeYoung, which is a career. It's a career. But you want him to hit his ceiling, and that's the thing that I think that was missed. And that's why you got to have guys like Ryan Fuller to work them with the AAA hitting coaches to get this guy to reach his ceilings. And here's the quote that I really liked from his introductory press conference. Uh, this is from Scott Merkin of MLB.com. Quote, when you play video games, you can st you start the at level one. And when you beat the level one boss, you go to level two. You don't jump to level 30 right away. It's going to have that feel of making sure these guys are building their skill every day. As we are building that skill, we're going to look to problem solve. End quote. And I think that's a huge problem in the White Sox organization in the past, especially under former team president Kenny or former executive vice president Kenny Williams and former team uh, general manager Rick Hahn. Everyone basically, you know, it was like they started at level one and then you put in that Mike Tyson's punch out cheat code to get to Mike Tyson. Well, you're going to lose if you don't go through at least some of the guys to learn the game. Because especially how Mike Tyson, because Mike Tyson is basically like the major leagues. One hit, one punch to the face, little Mac is down. I mean, it's very, very hard. And that's the thing that they were doing. They were taking guys from level one to basically to the final boss or not even to the level one. I mean, Andrew Vaughn basically went from college to the big leagues. Okay. I know there was the pandemic area era, but you know, the pandemic season, but still didn't barely got any minors. Gordon Beckham, another one. You know, he just rushed everybody along. They just rushed everything. And having these guys, you know, go through level two, you know, and, and some guys, yes, they can get through the levels using the P-Wings. And they can get through and they can get through and they're just naturally talented. But that's natural talent. And the Sox were terrible at thinking natural talent was development and wasn't. You know, there's a system. Put a system into place because I'm tired of watching the system produce bench players such as Gavin Sheets and replacement level players such as Vaughn. I want studs like we saw in the late 1980s and the late 1990s. I want Frank Thomas, Maglia Ordonez, Carlos Lee. And this team doesn't do that. Although I would like Fuller to help Chris Getz and Director of Amateur Scouting Mike Shirley impart the Orioles draft strategy at the top of the draft. Uh, outside of Jackson Holiday, the Orioles have taken college position players in the first round. And then they use rounds two through three, you know, and they get high schoolers like Gunnar Henderson and, and Kobe Mayo. So maybe they kind of overpay, but they use rounds one through four as those organizational building picks. That's got to be the focus one through four. This is where we're going to get our talent. This is where we're going to get our foundation players, or at the very least, we're going to get those guys that we can know that we can develop into valuable trade pieces. Joy Ortiz, for example, was drafted in the fourth round. And they were able to use him to get Corbin Burns. And Ortiz is also off to a fine career. So having Fuller is a start, but you've got to give him the players to work with. So that's where the work obviously needs to be done. Um, I'm excited to see what he does. However, a few too many times he cited Marcus Thames and how they're talking about working together. Um, the only reason why I don't like that is I, I, I just I think the whole coaching staff should have been blown out, except for maybe Grady Sizemore, because obviously he was doing the Sox a favor by being the interim manager, nobody wanted it, and he earned the players' respect. But I really wanted Venable to have free reign of who he picked. Now, maybe Venable has decided that, you know what, Marcus Thames is my hitting coach because you can't really blame Thames too much for the hitting because of just he wasn't given much to work with. So, And if it sounds like to me Ryan Fuller is basically the hitting coach, but he's just the hitting coach over the entire organization. 
and all the hitting coaches then will be his assistants. And that should be the way it is. You know, Will Venable should be worried about winning the game in front of him. And yes, he should give feedback if you know he's got ideas to help a hitter. But otherwise, I want Venable worried about the clubhouse culture and trying to prepare the team to win that game right in front of them. Well, Sox games will be on the uh, Chicago Sports Network in 2025. CHSN just launched its direct-to-consumer streaming service. Let's discuss if the cost is way too high for a bad team next on Lockdown White Sox. The World Series, Super Bowl, the Olympics, the world's top athletes get to play in these top-level sporting events thanks to one thing teamwork and teamwork can also protect your financial legacy and your family's future select quote licensed insurance agents and the, are the perfect teammates when shopping for customized affordable life insurance they can find you the right policy to keep your financial legacy safely in your family's end zone select quote is one of america's leading insurance brokers with nearly 40 years of experience helping over 2 million customers find over 700 billion dollars in coverage since 1985 other life insurance brokers offer impersonal one-size-fits-all policies that may cost you more and cover you less while select clothes licensed insurance agents work for you to tailor a life insurance policy for your individual needs in as little as 15 minutes and if you're in good health they work with carriers that can get you the same day coverage for up to five million dollars no medical exam required and these policies are more affordable than you think you could get coverage for up to one million dollars for as little as twenty dollars per month get the right life insurance for you for less at selectquote.com slash locked on Go to selectquote.com slash locked on today to get started. That's selectquote.com slash locked on. Select quote, they shop, you save. Hey, welcome back to Locked On White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Again, make sure to hit the like button on today's episode and subscribe to the YouTube channel at Locked On White Sox if you've not done so already. And if you can't catch the show on YouTube, Locked On White Sox is available on all major podcast platforms. So make sure to follow or subscribe on places such as Apple or Spotify. Either way, get your 30-minute fix of Chicago White Sox baseball venting with me. All right, so leave it to Jerry, leave it to a Jerry Reinsdorf back venture to be completely tone deaf when it comes to price pointing. I mean, this is the guy that once raised ticket prices after the 1994 strike. I should know because that's one of the reasons why my dad dropped the season tickets. But also, just leave it to a Reinsdorf back venture to keep stumbling on a rollout. Nearly six weeks after debuting CHSN, the new television home for the Chicago White Sox, along with the Bulls and Blackhawks, has officially announced its direct-to-consumer streaming services. And while every daters heard me go over the rumored price a few weeks back, uh, they actually went through with it, and it's just my opinion. And again, this is my opinion. If you want to pay it, fine. It's just way too high for what they're trying to feature. And right now, it's bad basketball, bad hockey, bad baseball. And also delaying the rollout kind of as a part of a negotiation tactic with Comcast. At least that's what I read from uh, Scott Powers' interview with the CHSN uh, president. Um. Not not maybe the best move. Again, this rollout has been clunky and terribly inconvenient. And now that it shouldn't be given the state of all three franchises. All three franchises are bad to the point where, you know what, you could. And I know some of you have. Hopefully you're still checking back in. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. Um, You could easily walk away from the White Sox or the Blackhawks. And come back when they're better. Hopefully they get better. Not miss it. Or just never come back at all. Because they're doing that. I mean, when you're bad, when you're putting out a, 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 a bad product, and, and granted, a lot of things came into place, a lot of context came into place to why all three teams are in this situation. But when you're this bad, you cannot make it where it's easy for your audience to just walk away and be like, you know what? I'm not dealing with this anymore. You know, I got to deal with what watching a bad team. And this is the snippet from the official press release. Uh, the Chicago sports network, CHSN, the home of the Chicago Blackhawks, Bulls and White Sox today announced that the network is rolling out its new subscription streaming service for fans. Starting Friday, November 15th, CHSN will offer fans the opportunity to stream Blackhawks, Bulls and White Sox games on the CHSN app available on iOS and Android or on any web browser. 
The CHSN Live Game Center at the Platforms Core will feature live streams of Blackhawks, Bulls, and White Sox games, real-time game coverage with in-game highlights, pre-game and post-game coverage, including interviews with athletes and coaches. Subscription packages will start at $19.99 a month for one team or $29.99 a month for full access to CHSN, including all three teams' live games. Fans can enjoy a free seven-day trial of a package of their choice. The streams can also be cast from the web or the app to larger screens, including your TV. Okay. So what's more appealing to you? 30 bucks a month for MLB TV that includes pretty much every MLB team every MLB team depending on blackout restrictions. You know, I feel bad for you if you live in Iowa. Um and the Sox minor league games where the hope is or pretty much 30 bucks a month since there's likely taxes involved that's why I'm rounding up for just Sox and then bad hockey and bad bas- basketball. Okay? I'm taking the MLB TV package. So I'm just giving you right there. You can actually, and I know you might be like, hey, I'm very hyper-focused on my teams. But maybe you need a palate cleansing and you want to watch, uh, say, a Dodgers game. That's what I did. Or again, I want to see Noah Schultz. I want the hope. I got to see the AA Birmingham Barons this year. Or how about this? $11.99 a month, depending on your blackout restrictions again, for all the NHL games, a ton of extra college basketball games. Yes, I loved watching WAC basketball. Football. College hockey, golf, insider articles with ESPN Plus, because that's what I was paying. Now, yes, I can afford $41.99, but I was getting banged for my buck. That's the biggest reason why I'm not happy with this price pointing. $19.99 for just White Sox is not getting your bang for your buck, especially since you could go get tickets for a Sox game on the secondary market for relatively cheap. You could probably get tickets. I, I was seeing what as low as like four bucks at one point, and then go get a hot dog, you know, or their delicious food. And if you take the L, like you could get all that for nineteen ninety nine. Now, granted, it's one game, but still, think about that. Okay, I do believe though they're offering a CHSN uh, subscription for free if you're a Blackhawks or Bulls season ticket holder. But again, it's only for the specific team. So if you're a Blackhawks season ticket holder, I do believe I saw that report. You're only going to get the Blackhawks games. And I would love to talk to whoever price pointed this to get the reasoning because you could get the NBA League Pass, and again, blackout restrictions are dependent, for $16.99 a month. So you could get every game. And again, it just depends on where you live. And the only thing that I think is propping this up is the stupid blackout restrictions that I can't stand. People want your product. Don't make it harder to get your product. Just appropriately price point it. That's it. And that's where I get frustrated because this is just a money grab by Reinsdorf and the and the Words family. It's been inconvenient for a lot of fans. As I've been seeing on social media, the over the air single has had have, is having trouble coming in for a lot of folks. They're still not on an Xfinity. And again, read Scott Powers' interview with the CHSN president discussing the problems that they're having. Because Comcast is basically not even engaging in talks. They keep calling Comcast. I it, it, just the vision I got in my mind was they're calling and Comcast is like, uh huh, uh-huh, yeah, mm, bye. Right there, fifty percent of the Chicago market can't watch games, and I'm out of market. I can't get my Blackhawks games right now because Chicago is now claiming my home market, and they still have not secured the over-the-air signal. So I either have to pony up nineteen ninety-nine a month for Hawks games. Or I could listen to it for free on WGN Radio. And then I could go find the highlights on YouTube. Because that's the other thing. There are now alternatives to getting and consuming your team. Especially if they're bad. Okay? It feels like a grift. And it feels like if I don't, you know, it feels like it's just another excuse that they're, the White Sox are going to use to not spend money. Because they'll be like, see, nobody's paying for our streaming. Regional number, you know, our, our money's down or if it revenue's down. And heck, Milwaukee, drink, had $19.99 for a while where you could get the now FanDuel Sports. You could get Brewers, Bucks, and Wild Games. And the Bucks have won a title this century. They've got Giannis Antetokounmpo. If it was $19.99 even for all three, fine. Still think it's a little bit too much. I think $11 to $14 would be fair as I've cited all this stuff. But $19.99 for one team, $30 for three plus. And all their shows, and I, I think they're doing great well, you know, good with the content, but that, too high for me. 
Well, I rolled out a new weekly segment, Top 5 Friday, last week, so let's go over the literal top five home run hitters in Sox franchise history next on Locked on White Sox. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers... Uh, Right now, new customers can bet $5, get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. I always maintain FanDuel spreads over unders and money lines are fun to play, but if you want to win big or at least double your money, FanDuel's parlays, props, and futures is the way to go. And we may not like ties in America, but if the first half of the Chicago and Green Bay game ends in a tie, and that's the first half ending in a tie, last I checked, it was at plus 850. You put, say, 10 bucks on it, you just won 85 bucks. And the Bears somehow going into the locker room up. That's at plus 210, so at least a chance to double your money if that somehow happens. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Welcome back into Lockdown White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Again, shout out to all my everydayers. I appreciate your loyalty. Please hit the like button on today's episode. Recommend to your fellow Sox fans or baseball fans, friends, and subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox or wherever they get their podcasts as this show is available on all major podcast platforms. And hey, feel free to leave a five-star review. I'd really appreciate it. All right, since I'm hoping Ryan Fuller helps bring back power baseball to the South Side, I figured I would do my top five Friday going over the top five home run hitters in the White Sox history. And this is not subjective. I'm going to share the actual top five career home run hitters of all time because, honestly, a personal list, that would be hard to put together, especially since I never saw the likes of Dick Allen or Bill Melton play or, um, you know, Minnie Minoso. Never saw those guys play way before my lifetime. So, and also, even in my lifetime, Albert Bell, Jim Tomei, you know, they were only here for a couple of seasons, but they were fun. Some of my favorites to watch launch the ball. Robin Ventura was always underrated as a power hitter. Avon Calderon, definitely under hit, underrated. And the few times Ron Karkovice did get a hold of a ball, man, he could crush a country mile. So that's why, since it's, it's very subjective, it's very hard to even be subjective on this. I'm going to go objective, and I'm going to go literally with the facts. And here, from 5 to 1. Number 5, Carlton Fisk, 214 career dingers, Hall of Famer. One of the biggest signings early in the Reinsdorf ownership era. Obviously a favorite of mine as a young kid. Uh, you know, I don't nearly cite him enough on this show. Uh, maybe it's because also like just he kind of went away because of how he how he was treated so badly at the end of his career with the White Sox. You know, breaks Bob Boone's record for most games caught behind the plate in 1993 and then gets released because, yeah, I mean, he was a shell of himself in 93. I mean, his numbers were declining. You know, there's always the talk of how great he kept himself in shape, but it was just, it was time. But he gets released, comes back for, you know, game one of the 1993 World's um, ALCS, just wants to wish his teammates luck in the clubhouse, and he gets thrown out. And he's been, you know, he was bitter a lot about it, and he was. He was treated very badly at the end. You know, obviously they gave him the Harley, they gave him the nice send-off, that type of stuff. But to just say you can't even come and say, hey, guys, good luck. You know, that led to the feud, him choosing to wear a, a Red Sox cap in the Hall of Fame, where, yes, obviously the most iconic moment in his career happened with the Red Sox, you know, especially in the 75 World Series. But come on, broke his records on the South Side. You know, he broke records on the South Side, I mean. Number four, Harold Baines with 221 home runs. Uh, I was actually at the game as a kid where the Sox surprisingly announced his number of retirement after he was traded to the Texas Rangers in 1989. Obviously, one of my favorite players, too, as a kid growing up. Heartbroken when he was traded. Like that was my first real heartbreak as a kid and should have been a sign of things to come as a, being a White Sox fan. Obviously overjoyed when he returned and then he just kept leaving and coming back, leaving and coming back. But obviously love Harold Baines. I got a Baines jersey in my closet. You know, when I do put it on, people will notice that. And they always ask, why are you wearing Harold Baines? Well, he was my first favorite player as a kid, along with Ozzie Gann and Carlton Fisk. Those are the next two jerseys I got to get. Number three, Jose Abreu with 243. Don't bring him back this year for a reunion. I mean, you can bring him back if he officially retires and recognize him. 
you know, uh, obviously I want number 79 retired. Appreciate that he was the draw during the dark days of the previous failed rebuild. But no, I don't, I don't, I don't want a reunion. Sorry. I want his number retired. I don't want to give him his flowers, obviously. Number two, Paul Canerco with 432. Probably hit the most uh, historic home run in franchise history to date when he crushed that Grand Slam in the 2005 World Series. Uh, too bad he may have to wait for a committee vote to get him into the Hall of Fame, and I wonder if he'll ever get in. I wonder if he'll ever even get to a committee vote. Because 432 dingers should get you some consideration, but when you look at a lot of the rest of his numbers, I hate to say it, it is Hall of, it's Hall of Very Good, and that's what everybody keeps saying. Hall of Very Good. White Sox legend. Keyword on the White Sox legend. You know, just because... A lot of the numbers that he did, he was just very, very good, but maybe he was never an elite, you know, never won an MVP, that type of stuff. Number one, the big hurt, Frank Thomas with 448 Hall of Famer. A couple of days ago, CHGO's Sean Anderson was on the show. We talked about his time on that 2005 team and how his time here ended a little salty. But man, when he was here, he was the greatest hitter to ever put on a White Sox uniform. But notice the trend here. The Sox either drafted in the first round, Baines and Thomas or made a shrewd trade, Canerco, or made an international free agent signing, Abreu, or big free agent signing, Fisk, to get these guys here, and then they were here long-term. These are maybe avenues the Sox should keep trying now, go back to, to get good players on this club. You know, get back into the get back into those habits, obviously. Well, that wraps up this edition of Lockdown White Sox. Thank you for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen today. For your second listen, find Lockdown MLB. Baseball guru Sully brings you a daily blend of humor and baseball, keeping you updated on every rumor and story throughout the offseason. Find Lockdown MLB on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. And I'll be back Monday to discuss a few factors that should concern you and I when it comes to the White Sox getting a proper return for uh, for Garrett Crochet. Feel free to leave comments about today's discussion regarding Ryan Fuller possibly being the solution to fix the Sox hitting even though he'll just be in the front office, the CHSN direct to consumer streaming service price and the top five Friday going over the top five home run hitters of all time. You can leave them at the episode page on at, you can leave them on the episode page at YouTube X formerly Twitter at Todd, at Todd J dub or at lockdown socks, or you can email me at lockdown white socks at gmail.com. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. And I will see you Monday.